What are you afraid of? What are you worried about? What brings you joy? Who reminds you of peace? God gave you your mind to think God thoughts and to become all he has called you to be. Maybe our minds just need to be rewired. Amen. Well, God bless all of you. And I pray that moms, you know that you're honored. Um, children, I pray that you take time to honor your mother and church. It's just good to be alive once again. Um, said it earlier, say it again. We're live at the Veterans Memorial uh, Auditorium in Pawtucket. Wanted to get outside. You'll understand that a little bit more as we dive into the word of God today. And I pray that this word encourages you and enriches you to be all that God's calling you to be. Now let's jump into what God has to say today. Growing up as a kid, uh, I remember watching old television shows. And those of you who are on Twitter, uh, last week, Little House on the Prairie had this very viral clip about a statement that was said uh, in, in Little House on the Prairie. Um, these old television shows are very interesting. And I remember watching these old shows, and there was this character who always would be there. And it was a coveted job for little boys, and that was to be the paper boy. The paper boy meant you were going to go through different neighborhoods. You are going to go through the neighborhood. And as you go through the neighborhood, you're going to drop off the daily news to the people in your neighborhood. That's it. You were the paper boy. You were the one who gave the news to the people. Now, going through this and watching these different stories of the paper boys, there were certain neighborhoods you didn't really want to go to, right? There were certain people you didn't want to say anything to because in a really good neighborhood, there's still that really scary house. And in a really bad neighborhood, there's always beautiful homes. And you, you, your charge was to go through the neighborhood and to give the papers out to the people in the neighborhood. That's that's it. Nothing complicated, nothing over the top. Your goal, your job is to deliver the paper. And it made me begin to think about in our own lives and our purposes and what God is calling us to be. There are times I believe that God challenges us to go on some trips in our minds to neighborhoods that sometimes we don't want to visit. That God will take you on a journey where you have to deliver news. I am this person to that old memory. I am this mother to the times where you were told that you may not be able to have children. I am this student to the times where those guidance counselors told you you shouldn't even apply to that school. I am this individual. Why? Because there are times where God will give us the space to go on a journey into some neighborhoods that we don't like going into, to some people we don't like talking to. Why? Because some of the greatest trips you're going to take are the trips to yourself. Some of the greatest journeys you're going to go on are the journeys where you're going to discern that who you who you are, what 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 agitates you, what worries you, what awakens you, what brings something out of you. And really in doing all of that, you're getting closer and closer to God. Because here's the good news I want you to see in the text. The, the, the solution to your worst problem, God has already given it to you. And sometimes God will peel you back so you can peel back the layers of your life, of your mind, of your worry, of your trauma, of your fear, of your future, of your success. God will peel back the layers so he can reveal to you, you know how to get through this. You know how to handle this. I just need to remind you what's already in you. If you don't believe me, Jonah, after he was thrown over into the water, God, well, he made him go on a journey. That's the story. Jonah chapter 2. You have your Bibles. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 2. And let's continue our journey with Jonah chapter 2, beginning at verse number 2. Jonah chapter 2. So our beginning of verse number one. I want to read the entire chapter. It's only 10 verses. I want to read the entire chapter and attempt to break down this entire chapter for us this morning. Jonah prayed to the Lord as God from inside the fish. I called to my, in the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I cried out for help in the belly of Sheol. You heard my voice. You threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me, but I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. The water off me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the fountain of the mountain. The earth with its prison bars closed behind me forever. But you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols for Take faithful love, but as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation is from the Lord. 
Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Jonah prayed to God from inside the fish. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The word of God for the people of God. People said, thanks be to God. Let's, let's pray together. God, allow us on our journeys to encounter you. God, allow us to go into the areas of our lives that we don't like going into. Allow us, God, to encounter the people in our lives we don't like talking to. Allow us, God, to get closer to you because you're forcing us to get closer to ourselves. Awaken us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to wrestle with, if I had to put a title on this, last week was learning to say no. This week I want to talk about memories that mature. Memories that 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 mature. Here's what's happening in this text. The ending of chapter one tells us that Jonah is vo- Jonah is thrown into the sea by the sailors. The sailors do so because Jonah, really in a real sense, wanted to commit suicide and uh, did his best to get the sailors to commit homicide. The sailors, here's the thing I want you to see about this text. The beautiful thing is God never wastes time. While the sailors threw Jonah into the water, God did not waste the time with the sailors that even their hearts, their minds, their souls, their spirits were turned back to God. Here's the thing, that Jonah in his worst mind moment still had the authority prophetically to get somebody else to be connected to Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. There is nothing that you can do that no matter how far you feel you strayed from God or trying to run from God, God will use you in your worst moment to even introduce somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happens in Jonah chapter 1. And the Bible says that God, that the sailors throw Jonah over the, over the, over the boat into the water and Jonah ends up going into the water. But we don't know exactly what happens other than this, that God sends and commands a great fish to come and swallow Jonah. It's amazing. It's the same Hebrew word that's used in the beginning of the text that God commanded a storm. He hurled a storm. God sent a fish. God commands a fish. And even at the end of chapter two, where God commands the fish then to hurl up Jonah. Here's what I shout about when I think about this fish, that this fish, while he ate Jonah, while he swallowed Jonah, did not consume Jonah. That God has some very interesting ways to put us in some positions where things will swallow you, but not consume you. Things will swallow just you. And that's the reason some of us ought to be able to thank God and praise God even this morning, that God has some ways in your life where things swallowed you but didn't consume you. They swallowed you but didn't destroy you. They swallowed you but didn't get rid of you. Why? Because God had a limit on the storm and the things that he sent in your life. That I thank God for storms that have limits. I thank God that my worst enemy can only do what God allows them to do. I thank God that my worst sickness can only do what God commands it to do. That the fish's assignment was not to eat Jonah, but to simply swallow him. Here's why. To peel Jonah away from the world so God could get Jonah's attention. In the midst of this moment, God, Jonah, sits in the belly of this whale. And I told you guys this last week, and I want to remind you of this again this week, that we don't know if the story of Jonah was an actual, real human being. Uh, some believe that Jonah's story was a superhuman story. That it was a story written for prophets to be encouraged, for prophets to know that God was there with them. Um, for some, we also believe that Jonah was a real story. Regardless, here's what happens in Jonah. God was getting Jonah's attention. Now, why is that important, Justin? Why is that important, Pastor Justin, to understand this understanding of Jonah. Here's why that's so important. That God and prophets, one of the things that God constantly did with prophets is that when prophets were called, God would peel the prophets away from where they are so the prophets could be one with God. We see that all throughout scripture. We even see it with Jesus' story. That when Jesus, when Jesus was baptized, the first thing that happens, the Bible says, and the Spirit of God drove him into the wilderness. It's a reason that God does something that before he releases you publicly, he has to get to you privately. That there are some things that we will not listen to God or understand from God in, in public that God will drive us into private spaces so that we can be strong in public spheres. And maybe the reason that God is doing some of this with some of us is so that God can get our attention to be people that God drives us into private moments with him so we can be strong in public. Because if your private prayers are what gives you strength to be strong in public spaces, the reason why you can stand and lead in public is because of your prayers in private. The reason why you can own who you are in public is because of your time in private in church. I want to challenge you today. We're going to get to this in the text that God is challenging so many of us to get back to be private it with God. We see this in all Old Testament literature, and as a matter of fact, it was a practice that was even practiced in Protestant churches until until the late 1800s, where, where 
Protestant preachers, when you were finished with seminary, your first calling was not to a church, but it was to the monastery. That there was an importance of being one with God, to know God, to be intimate with God, because my intimacy breeds the way I engage with God in the world and engage with God elsewhere. And throughout scripture, we see prophets that when God called them, he made them get intimate with him. When God selected them, God made sure that he was intimate with them. And that meant that God had spent some silent time with the people that God was trusting with his word. So in the same way, we see this manner in the text where God loves Jonah so much that he makes Jonah go into some private moments with God. And the way that God got Jonah's attention, the way that God made sure that Jonah would be one with him is that God put Jonah in the whale. He puts him inside the belly of the fish, and, and, and as Jonah's sitting in the belly of this fish, and Jonah's sitting in the belly of the whale, y'all, the Bible tells us that three days and three nights go by. Now, it's interesting. I, I want to just throw this in there for free. It's interesting that God gave the fish direction to, on exactly how to get to the place that Jonah ran from, that this fish, y'all, had such a great assignment to make sure that Jonah did not deviate from what God called him to do. Watch it. That Jonah sat on a journey that should have taken him a day to get to Nineveh. And God put this fish in position to make sure that Jonah was going to get to Nineveh. And so regardless, the text says that now Jonah's sitting in the belly of the whale, and here's all Jonah does in the belly of the whale, church. He prays. And the entirety of chapter 2 is Jonah having a conversation with God. Now I want you to grab a hold of this, because this, this conversation with God does not happen, we believe, until the end, the near the end of the third day, that as soon as he finishes preaching, he gives this over to God. The, the, the fish vomits Jonah up onto dry land. It's a very interesting and powerful story that this, this prayer did not happen as soon as Jonah got in the whale. That Jonah sits in this whale for three days, and the only thing we get recorded is the prayer he prays on the third day. There's something powerful about how God will encourage us and put us in positions because he knows that he's given to us, inside of us, what we need to solve what's in front of us. Here's why that's so important. The power of this text is not that Jonah prayed. Because I could preach and yell and scream about pray. You better pray more, better do more. The, the power is not that he prayed. The power is what he prayed. The power is how he prayed. When you read through the prayer that Jonah prayed in Jonah chapter 2, the power of this prayer, y'all, was that Jonah was in a posture of lamenting. He was in a posture of grieving. He was in a posture of giving himself over to God. He was in a posture of being disobedient to God. It was a posture of trying to get closer to God. And Jonah did not call upon the lament prayers that he knew. He called upon the praise prayers. Here's why that's so important. That Jonah being a Hebrew, Jonah being one who, who knew God, who had been to school for God, who had been to school or what it meant to be a prophet, who knew the different prayers, who had memorized the Psalms, who had knew all the songs to sing. He doesn't call upon a psalm of worship. He doesn't call upon a psalm of adoration. He doesn't call upon a psalm of lament. Jonah calls upon a psalm of praise. And it's interesting. It's not that Jonah prayed. It's that as Jonah went through the annals of his own mind, the prayer that he selected was a psalm of praise. And it's interesting, too, because he doesn't just regurgitate another psalm. Jonah actually pairs about 12 different psalms together and what they say and then puts his life into it. He, he pairs Psalm 86 and Psalm 14 and Psalm 142 and Psalm 145. And he pairs Psalm, all the Psalm 18 as well. He pairs all these different psalms together and brings together his own psalm. Because what God is teaching us in this moment, church, is that God is challenging us not to just regurgitate the same old prayer that we heard somebody else pray, the same old way of worship we heard somebody else worship, the same old way of doing things we heard other people do, but God is cultivating inside of us the creativity that doesn't just go into the world for us to make money, but the creativity that comes so we can be one with God in some awesome and creative ways. It wasn't that Jonah prayed, it was the way Jonah prayed. Jonah came and created his own song that we even sing to this day, that Jonah created his own song because of his connection to God. In essence, when Jonah went through the neighborhood of his mind and he got to the bad neighborhood of trauma, he got to the bad neighborhood of being a prophet, he got to the bad neighborhood of what he knew about Nineveh, he got to the bad neighborhood of his assumptions, his accusations, he got to the bad neighborhood of his pride and his arrogance, but yet in the middle of all of that neighborhood was this beautiful home. And Jonah saw inside that home the Psalms of praise. And instead of taking a moment to talk about how terrible he was, how horrible he was, how God should punish him for his disobedience, how God should walk away from him for what he did, Jonah takes the time and praises God. Jonah takes the time to adore God. 
Do you want to take some time to tell God how amazing he is? Do you want to take some time to be honest that God, listen, I was in the depths of the beds of Sheol, and the beds of hell. I was in the depths of seaweeds. God, things were choking me, taking life from me. But you know what, God? You raised me from the pit. And for that, I praise you. Here's what I believe God is challenging us to do, church. For a lot of us, and we talk about mental health and mental well-being in the midst of Mental Health Month as well. One of the things I believe that gets convoluted and gets misunderstood is the importance of solitude. The importance of being separate from the world in order to be one with God. The importance of being separate from what's around us so that we might be one with who God is calling us to be. One of the reasons I'm in nature today is because personally, I love nature. I, nature for me is a way I connect back to God. Solitude is not a one step practice. Solitude is not just done in a monolithic way, but solitude church can be practiced in so many different ways. And I want to challenge you to have the practices of solitude, of silence, of being connected to God so that when God challenges you to go to a Nineveh, you don't find ways to make sure you are distracted and going a complete opposite direction, but you go the way that God has called you to go. And that means there are practices necessary for you to be one with God. I want you to consider, church, today, I want you to consider your prayer life. I want you to consider the ways that you pray. I want you to consider how healthy is your prayer life? How has your prayer life evolved with time? How has your ways of engaging with God and talking to God and, in talk, and talking about God, how have they evolved or have they stayed stagnant? Has your prayer life gotten stronger or has it gotten weaker? And I'm not here to beat you up. I want you to be aware of these things because when we begin to really think about our prayer lives and how we're connected to God, about who God is calling us to be, what God is challenging us to be, I want you to think about how your prayer life has evolved or has it become stagnant. Could you create your own beautiful psalm in light of God's word and in light of what God has called you to be? Would someone be able to take the prayers that you pray? and say, listen, that is something that I can use as a, as a framework to help frame how beautiful and how wonderful God is. Dave, J, Jonah took David's words and Moses' words and Job's words and framed something that got him to a place where he remembered that he knew how to praise God in his mind. He just let everything else sugarcoat, everything that kept him distant from being obedient to God to pull him back to obedience. Church, how is your prayer life? You know, it's, it's amazing. A couple weeks ago when I had this conversation on mental health with my little sister, my little sister who's a licensed therapist in, in New York, my sister and I were talking about mental health and people of faith. And I asked my sister, I said, Camille, you know, it's very interesting that when we talk about mental health and people of faith, often it gets dumbed down to, well, you have faith, so you just need to pray about it. There's no reason for you to go to a therapist because you just need to pray more, you need to fast more, you need to think more, you need to go to more church services, you need to sing more worship songs because we don't want to talk about mental well-being. And my sister said something so powerful to me. She said, Justin, the reason why I love being a person of faith and a therapist is because, Justin, when, when, when something goes wrong, when something goes awry, she said, Justin, I can only do so much. I can only ask so many questions. She said, Justin, I can only say so much. I can only challenge them with so much. She said, but when I'm done, uh, she said, they can tap into something that's bigger than them. She said, Justin, when I'm done talking, they can tap into Jesus. They, they can tap into their prayer life. She said, because watch this. She said, because Jesus can then begin at a place that's bigger and higher and stronger. She said, because Justin, never forget his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. She said, I'll never be able to think like God, but I can lead you to get closer to the way that God wants you to think. I'll never be able to do what God, I'll never be able to do exactly what God does. I can lead you to a place where you can understand the power, the strength that God put inside of you so that you can do what God is calling you to do. There's nothing wrong with seeing a therapist. There's nothing wrong with having someone that can stretch your mind to begin to see things the way that God sees them, to do things the way that God is calling you to do them. And Jonah, in this moment, y'all, God throws him and commands a fish to swallow him so God can reawaken him. Jonah, you know how to praise me. Jonah, you know how to worship. Jonah, you know how to be a prophet. Jonah, you know how to be a leader. And watch this. I love you so much, man something to swallow you, not consume you, so I can get you where I need you to be. Church, in this moment of isolation and social distancing, in this moment of quarantine, in this moment when you're by yourself at home, how, how is your prayer life being strengthened and evolved in this moment? How is your prayer life being something that God and you can take a moment in the belly of a whale, in a
storm that makes absolutely no sense and a storm in the belly of a whale that makes absolutely no sense why you're not being consumed, why life is not ruining you, why things are happening around you. How can you take this moment and call upon the experiences and the scripture and the knowledge and the passions that you have inside of you without anyone else telling you anything that you and God can have such a beautiful conversation because you've had conversations with God before. You've learned about God. You've had enough preaching and teaching and songs that now you and God are sitting in the belly of the whale and you can be strengthened with the word of God. So that's what I want to give you. Don't be a time manager in your prayer, but invest in the purpose that God has on your life by investing in your prayer life. Here are three words I want to have you define for yourself today, and I'll give you some principles and we'll go on about our business. Here are three words I want to have you define for yourself today. I want you to define number one. I want you to define the word uh, passion. What does passion mean to you? I think what happens with the word passion that's been defined by culture, defined by self-help books, defined by, by people, and I want you to define passion for you. Number two, I want you to define peace. What does peace mean to you? When you think about the word peace, what does the word peace mean to you? I, I, and it can mean a plethora of things, but I want you to think about your own definition of the word peace. And lastly, I want you to define the word purpose. We live in this world and so many self-help books and things like that where we're being told what purpose and vision and goals are. What is purpose to you? And, when, and I told you this last week that often our greatest dilemma are our definitions. And I want you to think about how do you define these things? Because how you define a thing is how you engage in a thing. When you think about peace, and passion and purpose. What are those? And if you're not going to be a time manager in your purpose, define purpose. What are you here for? And it's not that deep. It really isn't. What are you here for? What are you doing? And what brings you closer to Jesus? Define your purpose, define passion, and define peace. Because I want to challenge you not to be a time manager, but a purpose investor. Not to be a time manager, but a purpose investor. How do I invest in purpose, Pastor Justin? How do I invest in this? How does God use the belly of the fish, the belly of a whale, to get me to invest in purpose? Number one, the first thing the text does, number one, is God challenges us to see that silence is a powerful solution. Silence is a powerful solution. Um, 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 there's a power, church, in stealing away and being one with God and having no one to talk to and having nothing else to get around you. If you guys can already hear on the microphone behind me, you can hear the birds chirping. You can hear cars going around. You can hear people talking as they're going by because it's amazing when you pull away from television, pull away from phones, pull away from technology, pull away from people, pull away from the worry and the fear of others that are cast on us, pull away from opinions. It's amazing what happens when you really begin to see how noisy the world is and even how noisy that makes your mind. God forced Jonah to be in a season of silence so that God could get Jonah's attention. Church, silence is a powerful solution. Here's why. In silence, you're able to grab control of the clarity that's necessary to pursue what God has put on your heart. It's in, it's in silence, church, that Jonah was able to remember the praise and the, that he was able to give God. It was in, it was in silence, church, that Jonah was able to call upon the Psalms that he already knew. It was in silence, church, that Jonah was able to grab a hold of what God has told him, what God has challenged him to be, and everything that Jonah could be. It was in silence that God, that Jonah was able to get back to himself. Silence is a powerful solution. But here's what I want to challenge you to do. I need you to communicate, uh, communi communicate the need to have moments of silence and boundaries to the people around you. If we're going to be people who are well, communicate the need for it so that you don't do like Jonah did last time, and that is kill me because I don't want to go to my purpose. Instead of telling someone, listen, God, I need some time. I need a wife. I need some time away. Husband, I need time away. Children, I need time to be silent. Why? Because I need to get myself back connected to God. Take time to be silent, because here's why. When, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I take time to be silent, I create spaces to be victorious, and I don't have to play the victim because I'm not giving time to God to get closer to me and for me to get closer to God. Church, I want you to know that silence is a powerful solution. There's nothing wrong with not having the answer. There's nothing wrong with pulling yourself away, going for a walk, getting into another bedroom, going into another space at home. There's nothing wrong with sitting with your eyes closed and hearing what God has to say. Silence is a powerful solution. God knew what was inside of Jonah. God needed to get the noise of the people around him that told him that he didn't need to go to Nineveh. He needed to get the noise of the sailors who were unsaved around him that were complicit in his disobedience. God needed to get Jonah away to be in silence. Silence, church, is a powerful solution. Number two. Thinking is a good thing. Thinking is a good thing. 
as Jonah sits in the belly of the whale, the reason why he was able to call upon the Psalms he called upon, the reason why Jonah was able to cultivate the prayer that Jonah cultivated, here's why Jonah was able to cultivate this prayer church, is because Jonah knew the difference between the different types of Psalms because of the schooling that Jonah went to. Jonah had went to school for what it meant to be a prophet, what it meant to be a leader, and Jonah knew the difference between lament Psalms and worship Psalms and adoration Psalms and praise Psalms, and because of what Jonah knew, his thinking able to, gave him an ability to access the voice of God within him, access the voice of God that was giving thing, making things clear for him. Here's why, because what it shows us, church, is that thinking is not a bad thing. I don't want you to get so caught up in thinking that your faith has to be so out there that you forget the ways that you're able to apply what God has taught you, what he's allowed you to go to, that college is a great thing. And don't think that because you learned engineering in school that you cannot take engineering and apply it to your faith journey. Don't think because you learned science in school, you cannot apply science to your faith journey. Don't think that because you learn ethics and English in school that you can't apply it to your faith journey because you learn social work. The greatest thing I'm seeing right now in the midst of quarantine are people who are tapping into the gifts inside of them because they're bright individuals. Listen, you went to college, you got the degree, own the degree, and let the degree be something that continues to unveil the face of God to the world. Yeah, you got a doctorate. Praise God for it. And let your doctor degree be a way that you unveil the face of God to the world. Yes, you're a leader. You have your MBA. Let your MBA be a way you unveil the face of of God to the world. And maybe you didn't even graduate from high school. Maybe all, maybe you have a high school diploma. Maybe you have your GED. Wonderful. Let what you've learned be a way that you unveil the face of God to the world. Thinking is not a bad thing. Thinking is not just for people who don't look like us. Thinking is not just for people who don't have something. Or thinking is not just for people who live in the suburbs. Thinking is a good thing. God gave you the authority to have the degrees, the connection, the wisdom that you have. And church, I need you to be comfortable enough to call upon what God has showered on you and share that into the world. Jonah was able to communicate this prayer, call back onto what God said to him, and then go forward into the uh, go forward into Nineveh simply because Jonah remembered what he learned in school there is nothing wrong with taking what you applied in your math class and applying it to your faith journey thinking is a good thing and don't be so afraid when you get into moments of despair get into moments of mental mental sickness get into the moments where you don't think you can do something that you get what God has already put in your mind to do you are a thinker. You're not just a survivor. You're a thinker. You're not just an overcomer. You're a thinker. And thinkers, y'all, are the ones that then begin to write things so others can think about it, too. You are so well-equipped, you trendsetters, to be amazing thinkers, to go into the world and change things. And here's the last thing. I want you to know that silence can be a powerful solution. Thinking is a good thing. But then lastly and finally, I want you to give some time to God. Jonah gets into the whale. He's silent in the whale. Jonah gets into the whale. He's thinking about and remembering everything that God has said to him, everything that he learned in school, and then applied that to his moment, this moment with God. But here's the main part of this whole text. Three days and three nights, Jonah's with God. Three days and three nights, Jonah's with the Lord. I want to challenge you to give some time to God. Now, here's where I got this from, um, and I'm, I'm going to give it because you're going to hear it this week if you listen to our midweek series. My mother is joining us this midweek series, and uh, my mother, uh, she, she, she's talking about the necessity of, of, of the trends of Sunday school in the midst of COVID-19. And at the end of the conversation my mom had with me, she said, Justin, you know, something I learned in this moment, she said, I learned the necessity to give some time to God. I said, that, that's, that's true. She said, no, my mother loves acronyms, and I, I want to give you this acronym, and I want to challenge us this week to actually practice this as well. My mother said, Justin, no, that this there's a difference between giving time to God and giving some time to God. She said, I was, I was so caught up in giving God a certain amount of time, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes here, and things like that. She said, but when I got to a place where I said, God challenged me to give some time to him. I said, what, is, what does that mean? But I said, Justin, I'll break down the word some to you. She said, first of all, when I get up with God, she said, every single morning, here's my practice. She said, Justin, I get up and the first thing I do, S. She said, I sit in silence with God while I'm sitting on my knees. I have some silent time with God while I'm sitting on my knees. She said, Justin, because knees are, they change my posture. They change where I am in the world. I can't walk around. I can't find places to go. I can't do things at the same time while I'm sitting on my knees. She said, I 
First of all, Justin, I spend silent time with God on my knees. Church, I want to challenge us to spend some, some time with God. And first of all, the first place we start is spending silent time with God on our knees. The, 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 when we change our posture, we change our pace. When you change your posture, when you change your posture of prayer, where you're not sitting in your bed, you're not lying on your bed, you're not sitting in a living room, but now you're starting your day on your knees. It gives you an opportunity to start in a posture of humility and repentance and, and, and anticipation that God is going to do something. Mom said, number one, Justin, I, I, I spend silent time with God on my knees. Number two, she said, then I, oh, I open my mouth to God in prayer and praise. She said, before I ask God for anything, before I request God to do anything for my life, she said, Justin, I open my mouth in praise. God, you're the water that I drank. You're the air that I breathe. You're the, the friend around me. You're the car that I drive. You're the gas in my car. You're the, you're the food on my table. You're everything to me I never even knew I needed. She said, Justin, I spend time opening my mouth in prayer and in praise. Here's why, Justin, because I need the time to pause and listen and, and give God and let God know that whatever you're going to share with me, I don't care if I like it or I don't like it, God, I'm going to praise you regardless. She said, I'm, I'm silent on my knees. And while I'm on my knees, I begin to open my mouth and give God glory and praise. She said, I spend some time with God. I'm silent with God on my knees. I open my mouth in prayer and praise. Number three, she says, then I meditate on what God told me yesterday. She said, Justin, I don't ask God to give me anything new yet. I don't even open my Bible yet. She said, Justin, I simply meditate on what God told me yesterday because God showed me something in the coworker that looked at me. God showed me something in the car that I was driving. I, God showed me something in the people that were around me. God showed me something in everything I went through. She said, Justin, I meditate on what God told me the day before because there was something in yesterday that God allowed me to learn about him that I'm going to apply to my day today. She said, Justin, so I meditate on what God is said to me yesterday. And as I meditate, I begin to anticipate that if God told me that yesterday, I, I can win today because God shared something amazing with me yesterday. She said, then Justin, after I'm silent on my knees, I open my mouth in prayer and praise. I meditate on what God told me yesterday. She said, thirdly and finally, I end my time in prayer. She said, Justin, after you begin to remember everything God said to you, you spend time on time with God on your knees, you open your mouth in prayer and praise, you meditate on what God has said to you. She said, Justin, then all you can do is just begin to pray and tell God, listen, if that's what you told me before, God, this is what I'm expecting you to do today. I'm expecting you to open this. I'm expecting you to change this. I'm expecting you to move this. I'm expecting you to open this for me. She said, Justin, because I'm spending some time with God. I end my time with God in prayer and praise. She said, there have been times where it's been five minutes. There have been times where it's been an hour. But she said, everything is different when you spend some time with God. Church, I, I want to, my son is learning how to swim. And uh, the thing about swimming is that when we taught my son how to swim and we're teaching him how to swim, we didn't immediately jump to deep sea diving. We, we got him some floaters and got in shallow water. And we're, we're getting him comfortable being in the water. We're getting him comfortable in floaties in shallow water. We're getting him comfortable in water that's not going to consume him. And as he gets bigger, we'll put him in higher water and more water and more water till eventually he can get into deep water, till eventually if he wants to, he can go be, go, go be a deep sea diver. But I think what happens too often in our life church is we jump to deep sea diving and we're sitting in the middle of the ocean with floaties on. And we're frustrated that we're not being, we're frustrated that we're not able to grab a hold of everything that God wants to say to us or challenge us to do. And we're feeling that somebody else knows more than us. Somebody else does more than us. Somebody else can do more than us simply because we're sitting in the middle of the ocean with floaties on when God says, sometimes, first of all, I just need you to spend some time with me. I want to challenge you in this season. I, I hope I know this wasn't super deep and all of that, but church, if we're going to be well mentally as Christians, it starts with your time with God. It starts and ends with your time with God. Let silence be the solution for you. Oh, um, let silence be your solution. Take time to be comfortable with your thoughts and your thinking. You are so smart and well-equipped to handle any storm that comes your way. And thirdly, I want you to spend some time with God, knowing that time with God is never wasted. Be consistent before you seek for depth. Be consistent before you seek for depth, because what you'll see is that the solution that you're searching for, God has already equipped you with it. He's telling you how to do it, and you're able to do that for you. 
I still believe great things for every single person watching this and engaging with this. I still believe great things for all of you even listening to this on our podcast. I still believe great things for all of you because God loves you so much that he welcomes you to spend some time with him. He welcomes you to be one with him. And he welcomes you even if he has to force you to be in the belly of a fish to get your attention to be the person God's called you to be. I want to pray for all my Jonas out there. I want to pray for all of you who might be in the belly of a fish. If you're wondering, Pastor Justin, break the text down, what the text say. Here's why I didn't get intentional to every single word of that verse, because I believe God is calling you to be in a space where you begin to write down the prayers that God is challenging you to pray, where God is calling upon memories that will mature you. Jonah began to call upon memories, the depths of the sea, Sheol he went to, but also the grace of God. What are the things that God has done in your life? But you cannot grab a hold of those until you can sit in silence, you grab a hold of the thinking that God has given you, the wisdom God has given you. And church, you proceed forward with some time with God. May God give you space this week to be one with him. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jonah's story. Thank you for our stories. God, give us the space this week. Give us the time this week. Grab a hold of who we are, the person you called us to be, that we might run forward and own our existence. Own the purpose inside of us. Own the passion inside of us. And own the future that you're calling us to live into. God, we honor you. We thank you for loving us and caring for us beyond ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go into worship for a second. We'll come